I'd like to start by acknowledging the meeting has been held on the traditional territory, the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Coast Salish peoples. This meeting is being live streamed and the audio for the, and visual recording will also be available to the public for viewing after the meeting. The footage of this meeting may be viewed inside and outside of Canada. It is our board's responsibility, and in particular my responsibility as chair, to ensure that our board meetings are conducted in a respectful manner. As we are, in the, as we are the board of trustees for a school district, it is important that everyone behavior that we would expect of our students in their schools. For any students in attendance or watching online, it is my expectation that we will model respectful behavior at this meeting. And having finished the opening remarks, I would like to hand over to uh, Aaron Davis, who will be um, introducing our students this evening, our students from Kalani. So thank you, Director of, Instru uh, Director of Instruction, Aaron Davis. Thank you. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce Rob Morrow, principal of Killarney Secondary School, where he has brought uh, three students to talk about Killarney's IT program and the innovative partnerships that it does to support innovation in technology. Mr. Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, before I introduce the students, I just would like to uh, acknowledge our two IT teachers, Marjorie Kokan and Seema Ali, who couldn't actually be here this evening. <laughs> Um, but they are so passionate about uh, our IT program and they put in so much work and so many hours that I, I, I wanted to mention them at this meeting. So today I'm very pleased to uh, be here with three Killarney students that are in our IT program and they're going to talk a little bit about what they experience in the program and um, I'd like to introduce them to you now. We have Lauren Lowe. And stand up, sure. Sean <laughs> Wallace and Ethan Roker. And I think we're going to start with Lauren. My name is Lauren. I'm a grade 12 student at Killarney Secondary School. And I became involved in the IT program as a grade 10 student. While looking through our course planning guide, I stumbled upon our extensive list of courses. Although slightly apprehensive due to my lack of experience, I signed up for Information Technology 10. I was pleasantly surprised to learn that the courses progress from the basics as if everyone is a beginner. The world of computer science has always been one of interest to me. The amount of technology in our lives is incredible. Social media, computers, cell phones, just to name a few. I wanted to learn more about what goes on behind the scenes to make everything work. I'm currently enrolled in Programming 12, and at the beginning of the year, our teacher told us we would be participating in a Microsoft program called TEALS, Technology Education and Literacy in Schools. The goal of TEALS is to bring computer science to every high school, and we are one of four schools, one, four Canadian schools in the program, along with Burnaby South, Hansworth, and John Oliver Secondary. A volunteer was brought into our classroom and has been extremely helpful having another instructor available. Not only are we able to get more help, but the extra support has allowed for new styles of learning and innovative projects to be integrated into the course. Ms. Ali, my teacher, has said that this is the most she's ever been able to teach in this course. And having a professional in our class provides a bridge between us and our futures. There is someone who has gone through the schooling and is involved in the industry that can answer any questions we may have about a potential career path. I'm excited about the prospect of using my knowledge gained from these classes in university and hopefully one day my future career. I have peers at other schools who too are interested in IT, but finding a starting point is difficult. I was lucky enough to have an established program at my school to start with. We offer many courses, as you can see, including a comprehensive Cisco program that prepares for industry recognized certification. Students learn an extensive amount about IT, from building computers to creating apps. Completion of the program earns 18 credits of Level 1 towards a two-year diploma at BCIT. TEALS has also allowed us to not only improve, but ex expand our program as we will be offering Computer Science 11 and 12 next year. I have always been an advocate for IT education in schools. IT is undoubtedly the way of the future, and allowing youth to start from a young age is extremely beneficial. 
There are many ways to problem solve, and the classes I have been in have challenged me to think outside of the box. While working in teams, I've learned multiple ways of approaching a task and gain different perspectives. This gives us experience for the real world, using interpersonal skills to work together to reach a common goal. Discipline, innovation, and resiliency are just a few of the things I've learned from these courses. My passion for computer science began with nothing more than a curiosity and love for learning, and I hope others will be given the same opportunities as I was to cultivate this interest through our high school years. Are your colleagues also presenting? Yes, and now uh, Sean and Ethan will be presenting a little bit more about the specifics of one of our courses, Programming 13. Great, thank you very much. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, we're gonna be talking about more about like the TEALS program in our, in our program, in our Programming 13 class, and we're also gonna be talking about the, how we kind of create the games and what goes into it and the problem solving and stuff like that. So some of the, when the TEAL programs come, the volunteers are very helpful as they give um, great insight to some, a lot of things I would never really think about when making a game or some of the tools that they use or um, stuff like, I don't know, different insights, stuff that really only comes from experience. So some a lot of these things really help with the design, really get you to know more about the industry and they allow you to really experience and learn more about the way things work in the outside world. Uh, this is important for us as it allows uh, <clears throat> it allows for us to learn new things that the teacher would not normally know as they're more in the job aspect uh, than our teacher and they constantly are learning new things to keep up with the growing technology. Uh, this has helped us make classes more interesting um, as we get to learn new things such as game design, how to manage workloads in a team, and how to manage files so that they do not conflict with it with each other, um, and also how to how all the different products work in the real world. Um, we also got a lot of experience in how to troubleshoot and identify bugs in our code. Uh, here we have some examples that we brought to you of the games that we've been making. Uh, here's the one that I've made so far. It is a uh, uh, RPG kind of game. It, uh, right here, you're looking at the uh, tutorial uh, that we've made for when the game is actually going to be released. This uh, here is a level where we will uh, give the player the instructions and uh, information needed to progress throughout the game. Uh, right here you're looking at is the main player that we have made. Uh, he's going to be one out of four. Um, and so far the only interaction that we've had is with a slime that we've coded in. Um, yes, as you can see, the slime's kind of special because uh, before it did not recognize the player. So how it works is it uses a radius uh, to uh, detect the player and it only follows the player if the player steps into that radius. Uh, this is also very hard for us to do as the floor is not completely leveled. So uh, when we initially created this, the player did not move uh, at, a, at a move correctly. He, uh, we had to calculate all the angles because um, if you look, uh, the floor is not completely flat and it's angled very weirdly. So yeah also can take damage and we're in the development right now to uh, get the character to deal damage back to the slime. Uh, here's Sean's game that he has been working on. Okay so this game is um, 2D and you we've created most of the tiles so you see the like the green grass and the and the edges to the grass you have to create each of these tiles in the editor and then you put them together in like a map so we designed all them to work together and we're pretty proud of it because it because it looks pretty good i think at least <laughs> um we also um use these the characters that are on screen that are moving around um we they're from like a basic template but we've edited them a little bit so they have a little bit more flair with the guy in the tux i guess that is um for the movement of the game it was pretty it was quite a bit of a challenge as 
before we were like trying to we were getting a point on the screen and then we would try to do like a ratio between the how far he has to move up to far, how far he has to move right and this didn't work out very well because um, it was kind of inconsistent as how fast you would move and different things of that but the teals program volunteer helped a lot he created a great suggestion which was just great create a line between the two points and then get the guy to follow the line and this worked out very well as he was very consistently and it seems perfect I guess um, um, also, as you can see, this is the editor we're using. We're using uh, Unity. Um, on the left, you have kind of how you'd set up like a movie stage. So you could think of like the background as like a green screen and the lighting and the camera effects, along with like the actors or um, I guess like uh, uh, snow or something like that. Something that adds in particles. Um, also on the right, you can see these are like the different things you can do to something. So for like a movie, it'd be like What's the camera lens? Um, what are the actors, like, what are they saying? Um, or like the green screen, what is it showing? Something like that. Also, there's lots of code that goes into all this. So to get the guy to move around, you have to program quite a bit of code. <laughs> if you can get that out, I don't know. It's OK. Oh, there we go. So you write a bunch of code, and then you have to define that and make it link between different files and different characters. Also. Uh, I guess that's it. That's all I really want to say. Um, Teal's program, very helpful in this project. Uh, they're, they're a great experience, so thank you. Okay, thank you. So thank you for sharing uh, some information about these specific programs that you have at Kalani. It sounds a very exciting program. Um, I don't know if we have any comments or questions from our trustees. Trustee Jan Pedley. Um, I'm super duper impressed. Um, my, my background's in IT, so I work in the industry. Um, and I started off having an interest in video games myself, the paint years of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and this is so impressive that you're you're doing this in high school. Um, and I'm really glad that this is um, this is an opportunity that's available to you. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> no problem, I guess. I know. Yeah, it's quite fun. Um, I know it's like, it's, yeah, it's really something that's not like, it's kind of more like a dream country. You don't really think about doing this kind of stuff. It's like, I don't know, it's like, I, I play video games quite a bit, so it's kind of interesting to bring ideas you have from there and bring them to the game and try to make things how you would want something to be. It's like, yeah. And Trusty Gonzalez? Uh, thank you, guys. That was uh, it was great. Good to see. This is obviously something for industry as a connection there, and I'm curious what that connection is. Is it something that's being promoted through industry? Um, and also, is this program, what's the likelihood of it being expanded into some other high schools? Because, uh, you know, we live in a high-tech city. It's a growing, growing industry. And this is priming you also for you as individuals to look at this as a career. So my third question is, are any of you actually interested in this as a career step? So I'll, I'll step in and say the second question should probably be for staff, but the first and third. I'm, I'm so sorry, can you repeat the first one again? <laughs> it, it, well, this could also be a staff question, just how it relates. Is it something that's been supported by industry, by our high tech you know, community? Uh, but so for, for you, the three of you, the question three is, is in relation to yourselves, is your next steps after high school? Um, unfortunately, I can't answer the first one, but well, you can. Well, well, when the companies give you, um, when they provide the volunteers, it really helps. Um, they're probably looking for more like an investment because then, as you train the students, you're probably going to get more people in your field as they've been inspired or encouraged to go back into it. So, if they, and also now they have connections into the people in the field, so you can like, if you go to a job interview, having someone that you know in the place is quite a good connection as you can relate to them and they can recommend you for the job to get better. So it's kind of like a cycle of uh, just goodness, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, the third one, personally, I'm looking forward to uh, actually go into game design at hopefully uh, one of the many game design um, workplaces in Vancouver. 
So uh, I'm looking, I'm uh, applied to SFU Computer Science and BCIT, and I hope to get in and continue learning how to design games. Yeah, I also, I'm looking to go into computer science, so I've applied to the local universities, UBC and SFU, and I hope to study computer science and get a degree in that. Any others? <laughs> Well, no, thank you very much, Lauren, Sean, and Ethan, for coming out tonight, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. So next on our agenda is the adoption of minutes, and first we have the meeting of December 17th, 2018. I'd look, like to look for a mover and a seconder for these minutes. So moved by Trustee Gonzalez. And seconded by Trustee Reddy. And I'm just thinking, as our students moved, I, I missed the op I missed the op I, I knew that uh, student trustee Pungelian was waiting to ask the question. I apologize. I, I missed that before they left. It was more just to uh, reiterate what they, they were saying. Um, I found it really cool that this program is bringing in mentors to really make their learning um, of information studies and computer sciences to make it more interesting and more engaging. But it was mostly a comment, but not really a question. Yeah. So I apologize for going a little out of order, but I, I did want to capture what you wanted to say. So we have a, a mover, Trustee Gonzalez, for approving the minutes and a seconder, Trustee Reddy. And are there any questions about the minutes themselves? So then I'll move to vote to approve the minutes. All those in favor? A unanimous vote in favor. And we have uh, on the agenda a matter arising from the minutes, which is a notice of motion from Trustee Parrott. And I think we're getting the motion on the screen. And Trustee Parrott. Thank you, Chairperson. I have um, alternate wording uh, for the motion on the screen, and it would read that the Board of Education appreciate, I guess, appreciates the continuing efforts of the Cavell community to advocate for their children in the seismic upgrade discussions and supports both the replacement school option and the expansion project as recommended in the VSB 2018-2019 five-year ca five -year capital plan. Okay, so we have, uh, I don't think we accurately captured the wording on the screen, so I think no. I'll just take a minute for that to happen. Thank you, Chair. It had a number of people working on it. Thank you. So that, that is the wording you're proposing? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, um, so, yes, looking for a seconder to the motion. 
Trustee uh, Chan Pedley. You'd speak to the motion, Trustee Parrott. Thank you. Um, capital management decisions and practices will be based first and foremost on meeting service delivery needs, e.g. students' education. That's from the report of the Auditor General. Will be based first and foremost on meeting service delivery needs. Any government ought to follow its own principles. I know that's a unique idea sometimes, but it makes common sense. I don't understand why common sense doesn't seem to have any place in decision making anymore. If we don't use common sense, if we remain silent because we don't want to rock the boat, we want to seem reasonable, we are actually supporting mediocrity. So maybe one's common sense can be different than others. So let's talk about process. If the choice is the cheapest, that's not a fair process. Actually, it's not a process at all. No government should pretend that it's willing to listen when in fact, it's proven over and over again that it will accept only the bottom line. Our community must expect better behavior. I hope the trustees will support the Cavell community as they advocate for the common sense choice and a proper fair process. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Trustee Parrott. And uh, other trustees speaking to the motion? Trustee Wong? Chairperson, I'd like to make an amendment to the motion and at the very end to include without delaying the project. Thank you, Trustee Wong. Do I have a seconder for that motion, uh, for that amendment? Trustee Gonzalez? As we have a seconder, yeah, would you like to speak to the motion, Trustee Wong? Thank you, Chairperson. I've heard a, a number of times in over the years uh, with regards to capital projects and be it the minister or staff that while we have this discussion, and it, it, it is an important discussion and direction, that there is the comment that the funds could go elsewhere and it has gone elsewhere in the past. Um, so I hope we have the, the comments with regards to the motion, it's the main motion, uh, with regards to moving ahead and, in, and basically restating and acknowledging the board's uh, preference of a replacement and expansion. We also have to keep in mind that we don't want to put this one in the back burners. We don't want other projects to, to move ahead um, and, and, and not have the Cavell si school seismically upgraded as soon as possible. So I think that's an important point to add with the direction that uh, the Cavell community is going as well as the board's hopes in that direction. Thank you. Uh, and speaking to the amendment, Trustee Parrott. Thank you, Chairperson. I, I speak in opposition to the amendment because this motion is dealing with the Cavell community advocating for their, their children. I think that um, if they're advocating causes a delay in the project and they're aware of that, that's, that's their decision. So I, I don't think for the purpose of this motion, it would be appropriate for us put, to put that requirement in their ability to advocate for their children. Um, any other trustees to speak to the amendment? Trustee Reddy? Uh, my comment, thank you, Chair, is not to this amendment, but a, a different suggestion. Um, we are speaking to this amendment at the moment, so we have to deal with this before we move to um, another suggestion.
Trustee Ballantyne. Uh, then through the chair, <laughs> this I'd like a comment from the Secretary Treasurer around the project itself. If we haven't really um, proposed a replacement school at this point, so does this motion mean that we are going to go back to the project office board and propose an actual rebuild? I'm not sure. What, can you just give me your sense of where this motion is taking us? Uh, through the chair, um, the Vancouver Project Office has approved the project that's on, that we've signed the agreement to do, uh, which is the um, the, the um, Yeah, the the upgrade project. So the um, this motion actually, I don't see this motion actually supporting the replacement option. The replacement option, I don't see that. You want to say? It says it supports both the replacement school option. I don't think the board is in a position to do that with this motion is what I'm trying to say. Okay. I, I think what the motion is speaking to is that, um, you know, we have ha I have had the discussion with the minister around, you know, the uh, preference of our staff on the VPO was to have a replacement school and that the board put forward an expansion to Cavell in the capital plan. And having had that discussion with the minister, there was no change in, so the board has supported those two pieces and there was no change in the plan for the school. It remains to be, it remains as a seismic upgrade at the um, current school size. So I think the, the motion is acknowledging that we have had, we have taken that action as a board and um, demonstrates the appreciation for the Cavell community. Um, and now what we're getting into is the amendment is I think the concern that the board wants to move forward seismic projects as fast as possible. So any, any action that would delay a seismic project would be very, would be uh, troubling to the board. I think I'm interpreting what Trustee Wong is putting forward there. So the expansion project, as recommended, is the is where we are as a seismic upgrade. Is that what that's interpreted to be then? I'm just trying to understand what the expansion project as recommended. Is that the seismic upgrade? Uh, the expansion project was the increase in size of the number of students in the school as we had in our capital plan. It's not the project that is moving forward at the moment. It was not the recommendation by the VPO. So this to follow up through the chair, if you will, then if this is passed, then we're changing direction and asking for a replacement school or that's what I'm trying to figure out. That's not my interpretation of the motion. Um, I would look to the secretary treasurer to, I, because I think it acknowledges our past actions and not actions in the future. Okay, Trustee Parrott is going to explain. Thank you, Chair. To you, the motion is um, to appreciate the parents doing this. It says nothing other than we appreciate them doing this, and, and of course we hope that they're successful. But from our point of view, we've, we've said that we support the, the replacement school option and the expansion. We said that in our, in our five-year plan. We haven't been successful in convincing the ministry of that. The parent, it's over to the parents now and hopefully they will be successful. Trustee Ballantyne. So then this motion really doesn't have any action for the board here. It's, it's no action here. It's just a showing of appreciation that there's advocacy going on in the community. So I, th I think we've slightly moved from discussing just the amendment um, but I think maybe that's part of the bigger discussion we're having. 
So if we could focus again on the amendment that's added without delaying the project. Trustee Wong. Uh, Chairperson, um, the ministry knows that we are we are supportive uh, supportive of the parents. Uh, this because we have the same direction. Our our recommendation was for a replacement school originally, and they know we want an expansion because that's in our five-year capital plan as well. And and that direction is, I agree with that, but not at the expense. And but I think the board's role, and board needs the focus is on safe schools and safe schools as soon as possible. So we can have both move ahead, support the parents, but. I've cautioned trustees uh, that I've seen this in the past that if we if we delay and hold off and ask the ministry to review this, we can make the statement. We've already made the statement. Let let's do the expansion at the same time. We already stated the replacement. So the delay is is the important part. And I've seen it in the past that there are we have all the other projects lined up and they are flowing quite smoothly at this point. So I'm not amending Trustee Parrott's uh, motion in terms of our support for the parents. I just wanted to add the part that the board believes in safe schools and safe schools as soon as possible. Thank you, Trustee Wong. Anyone else speaking to the amendment? Um, if there's no one else to speak, then I will say I, I, you know, I really want to find the best possible solutions for all of our seismic projects. But at the same time, I really don't want to delay any of the projects because getting safe students in, getting our students into seismically safe schools is my overriding priority. So I will be voting in favour of the amendment. Uh, speaking, Jennifer Reddy, Trustee Reddy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, so there's a lot of projects and I understand that we want to organize things accordingly. So with the Caval situation, and we're hearing that the formal proposal has already been approved, I'm wondering, in addition to supporting parents, is there something more the board can do? You, we had the meeting with the minister in terms of a formal proposal. Sorry, we're, we're still on the amendment. So I mean, that's what I would amend it for, and formally. We're, sorry, we're speaking on the amendment without delaying the project, but we can come back to a further okay. amendment if you wish. Is it Trustee Parrott? Thank you, Chairperson. I, I, I don't know how the project could be delayed. We, we, we carry on the way we will carry on. The, the parents will advocate. Perhaps they might get an agreement from the ministry that um, they can do that. They'll, they'll do that. Uh, but we carry on on the process that we're that we're on. So th there isn't a delay, right? There isn't one. We the process that we're going to follow is the process that's been outlined. Um, and the, I don't think that the parents can can delay that without some kind of an agreement from from the ministry in there as they advocate. Thank you, Trustee Parrott. So moving to the vote on the amendment without delaying the project, all those in favour? Trustee Wong, Trustee Fraser and Trustee Cham Pedley, all those against? Uh, Trustee Hansen, Trustee Cho, Trustee Parrott, Trustee Gonzalez, Trustee Reddy and Trustee Ballantyne. So the amendment does not pass. So we're back to the original motion. And speaking to the original motion, uh, I have on my speakers list, Trustee Reddy. Thank you. Through the chair, um, I'm just wondering, so when it says for their, oops, sorry, I'll just wait. For their children in the seismic upgrade discussion and formally supports both the replacement option um, as a suggestion of what we might put forward formally to support those efforts as a board. Because at this point, it's 
appreciating the parents' effort, I'm wondering if there's a role for the board to play with a formal um, addition to the support. Okay, so the proposed amendment is to add the word formally before supports. I, are you sure that's what you're suggesting? I think so through the chair, what I'm trying to get at is how can, like, what is the board's role in this motion, I guess, is what I'm having trouble reading into. I think uh, maybe Trustee Parrott can, I think Trustee Parrott has spoken to that and said that she's acknowledging the support that has been made in the past by the board to support the, the replacement school and to support the uh, expansion project. I think you're withdrawing the suggestion of an amendment. Yep, I can okay. do that. So we are back to voting on the main motion. And is there any other trustee to speak to this? Okay, then I'll call the vote. All those in favor of the motion as presented. We have unanimous support for the motion. So then we have a consideration of any other matters arising from the minutes of the December 17th meeting. And as there are no other matters arising, we'll move on to the superintendent's update. Thank you, Chair Fraser. <coughs> Thank you. In the ongoing conversations and discussions that we have had at previous board meetings, just a reminder of some of the things that we have discussed on previous occasions um, with my goal to bring forward to the board um, information on student outcomes and how we can continue to improve um, the results that our students have as they transition through our K-12 system. I reminded the board previously that your role as a board of education in the School Act is about improving outcomes for students your own board policy sites that we are responsible for improving the outcomes at the last meeting. I shared a little bit of information on some educational research that also spoke to the value in looking at what it is that our students are doing and how do we know that what we are doing as a system is making a positive impact on their lives. And also at the last meeting spoke a little bit about some research that the school district is involved with called the Deeper Learning Dozen, um, which talks to how do we know what we're teaching students how do we get them to make some personal connections to their learning and then take that, uh, those learnings and make them uh, creative in their own understandings. So what the plan would be, and I'm working on this with some of our district team, um, is January, which is now through to February, is to engage in conversations about what does student success mean. So to trustees, when we say those words, how would you actually define or how would we know when students have been successful in our system? And certainly with our stakeholders at various meetings that we've had as staff already, we've started to talk about um, engaging our greater community in a conversation about student success. At our next meeting, what I would like to bring forward to trustees is some, are some examples of outcomes that we do measure. And the example that we will use in February will be around our completion rates for our students and to provide trustees with our most recent completion results and also to disaggregate the data a little bit and look at some subpopulations within our community and see how they are doing with respect to completing our secondary school. I also look forward to bringing back to trustees a little more information about a roadmap to give you some more specifics about the dates of those meetings, who will be a part of those conversations, and certainly to receive feedback from our trustees as we start to go forward. By the end of February, we hope to have the roadmap finalized for you and we will bring that forward to the board. We are looking to design and plan what our actual partner sessions will look like. And very much we want to use an inquiry approach, an appreciative approach 
the inquiry around um, spirals of inquiry is a structure that we use already within our district and our school communities are well versed in that. So we will take the time to share more information with trustees and certainly from an appreciative approach, which is what is it that we're already doing in our schools that works really well? Um, how do we continue to take that forward, but also to look at what are some other iterations or work that we can do as we start to explore um, student outcomes? Certainly engaging our communities and we see as part of our roadmap that March through June, we would engage our stakeholders and our community members. Um, we would look at what the factors are that actually impact student success. And again, I think there's lots of opportunities to uh, surface some very timely and some very relevant um, impacts that we deal with as a school district and do that in the context of improving outcomes. And again, what is working well? That's the appreciative piece and what do we want to do more of? And certainly as we go about that consultation process, we would bring back to our board what it is that we are hearing. And again, how do we know that we're actually making a difference? And then finally, as we look ahead into the upcoming school year, we want to assess what we've heard around the inquiry process, um, share with each other what we are actually learning and what it is that we actually need to do differently. And as we look ahead into the upcoming school year, then we would determine our next steps and continue to look at other ways that we can actually assess outcomes for our students. So our purpose would be, and I mentioned this um, at a few of our meetings so far this year, to create a collaborative culture that focuses on excellence and on equity, which I know we've already raised that word with our board previously, and then our outcomes for students. The objectives would be, as we go about this work, to define student success, to actually improve outcomes for students, which is the responsibility of the board, certainly to celebrate what it is that we are doing that is working well and that is making a positive difference, and then also to take the time to monitor and to evaluate the progress that we're actually making with our, our young people and as a system. I've already mentioned some of these words, but the process we would undertake, we see it being a very collaborative approach, using that spirals of inquiry, which is an appreciative, positive look at what we're doing well, the engagement of our community and not losing our student voice and looking forward to working with Hazel and connecting with our VDSC um, as we go about the work as well, because they know what they want from the system and we should be listening closely to their words. And then we need to look at what are the success factors. So what are the measures within the Vancouver School District that we actually want to use? What are the metrics that will help us understand what it is that we're doing and how we know and identifying what those are? And then again, that continual cycle of improvement for our students. We also need to be aware of what our challenges are. And I think our culture is such that we don't systemically have a lot of indicators of measuring student outcomes. So that's something that will be a change from what we have done previously. And certainly we want to do it in a very collaborative collegial way as we go about this work. So making sure that all of our stakeholders feel very involved and uh, a part of the conversation so that we can ensure that we're bringing everybody along as we look to what we want to use to look at our student outcomes. So our next steps, as I mentioned at the next meeting, I'd like to bring forward some actual data for trustees to look at and then begin the process of engaging our stakeholders. And that is my report this evening. Thank you, Superintendent Hoffman. And next we have our student trustee report from student trustee Pungillian. Thank you, Chair. And first, um, I would like to acknowledge that Suzanne Hoffman's um, report is definitely a great reflection on how my report will go um, in terms of engaging student voice and making sure that students are being heard within our education system. So for my trustee report for January 2019, I would like to provide a summary of the student input I have gathered. So following the discussion of the December 17 meeting of the Board of Education, as student trustee, I chose to seek input from students on anti-racism and diversity education within our schools. I did this by involving the VDSC senior executive team and together we planned to include this topic in our December VDSC general meeting. Um, uh, during our student issues discussion. 
So together we crafted two questions that asked the student represent, re representatives of the VDSC, what strategies are currently in place to support diversity in schools and what methods of methods students feel are effective in supporting anti-racism education. Our questions were specific and focused on gathering student opinion and conversation that followed um, that followed suggestions that um, students want to focus on teaching respect, acceptance, and open-mindedness on a day-to-day -day basis. So on this matter, students at the VDSC shared the following three themes. Number one is effective strategies that are, are student-led and student-focused. So students noted that messaging, um, sorry, I can't, okay that noted that messaging about student that anti-racism is most effective when the messaging uh, uh, comes across from students themselves and student-led strategies where were brought from were brought forward by multiple VDSC representatives as being already present within some schools. For example, one initiative encouraged respectful behavior by students nominating other students for a reward for kind or thoughtful behavior. Another student-focused strategy is what students defined as a safe space meeting room. This strategy consisted of a room that serves as a place for all students to have open-minded conversations and meet new people. The students at these, at these schools are supported by their administrative staff, teachers, and community schools team to create this safe space. So it's very community involved and community created. Um, the goal is to create an open communication channel where students can speak of their concerns with no judgment to admin or teachers or, again, their own communities. For example, um, described by VDSE representatives, the rooms were successful and appreciated by the students themselves. This is a great example of how students are helping other students and how um, student-led strategies really um, support um, the school community. And finally, uh, forums and open discussions led by students were suggested. These forums encourage open discussion and promote transpar transparency, and also, again, led by students. Um, I feel as though when students lead their own strategies and really um, create their own discussions, they really do um, get into some great information because yeah. Um, so number two is students support restorative process. So when an issue arises in a school community, student voiced support for restorative process. Students wanted to know about what happened and what and want the opportunity to focus on apology and healing through restorative process. Students also wanted to work in partnership with adults to plan and implement restorative processes. Students felt that it was important to hear from one another and can speak and ask questions with the purpose of increasing understanding. This is sometimes achieved through assemblies and presentations focused on LGBTQ plus or anti-racism. VDSC representatives express the need to address wrong or offensive behavior in a way that is respectful and focused on moving forward and learning. Number three, Students value having anti-racism education integrated into daily curriculum, so on a day-to-day -day basis. Rather than adding an anti-racism education outside the classroom as an extra, students thought it would be more effective to address it as a part of the curriculum and to integrate it into class. Learning through regular class content, such as Planning 10, or classes such as social justice or peer tutoring, uh, were seen as particularly effective as they were ho as was hosting seminars in specific classes that supported inquiry and discussion with teachers and fellow students. So students also talked about the value of supporting teachers to contextualize information being presented and to take the opportunity to discuss it during class. Um, for example, um, How to Kill a Mockingbird, there's some language in there that is very offensive and um, to this day and age, it is not necessarily appropriate. So stuff like um, having teachers discuss why it is wrong in our day-to-day -day, um, age and why it is students should not be using certain language and um, derogatory terms. But anyways, um, 
Yeah, so in concluding this topic, as the board has raised the issue of anti-racism education for students, I hope you have found the opinions of VDSC students insightful. Thank you. And thank you, Hazel, for your thoughtful follow-up from the last board meeting. So we move on to, um, so we have a question, Trustee Reddy. Thank you, through the chair. Thanks so much, Hazel. I was just wondering if there was any details shared around the places and spaces where students are finding opportunities to lead strategies. Um, from the discussion that was apparent during the VDSC meetings, all of these student-led strategies were um, brought to the administrative staff to start. Um, students would just organize own groups that, um, you know, who felt the same way. Um, for the safe spaces that were started, um, one school um, worked with their community schools team to start that. It wasn't any like formal, um, you know, organization that started it. It was really just a student who felt the need to Im um, implement this into their um, secondary school. So. Um, it's really just giving the opportunity to let students um, put something they think is necessary into their schools if they find it helpful. Um, not, it didn't go through any student council, it didn't go through any organization, it really was just a student who had the resources and had the opportunity to reach out to their admin and their admin feelings um, we're willing to support this and also their community. So, yeah. Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. Just um, wanted to ask also the student forum, is that's coming up, is it not? Do you want to say something about that? Just remind us. Um, so the student forum, although I'm not too informed as to who is running it, I, I'm aware that it's involving all 18 secondary schools and they are um, sending in at least five to 10 students to come to this forum where I believe it is students um, and facilitated, but Suzanne could answer. Thank you. I was going to ask our Associate Superintendent Rob Schindel if he could provide the date and time of the student forum. Yes, through the chair, um, the uh, student forum, district student forum on student learning is on February 7th. It's at the Italian Cultural Center. Um, it has been organized by um, a group of students from numerous uh, secondary schools in the district, and um, they plan on having about 280 students in attendance at that forum. Go ahead, Hazel. Um, through the chair, I'd like to ask the superintendent Schindel. Um, sorry, not superintendent. <laughs> um, do you know the certain um, secondary schools who organized this or the organization that led this? So through the chair, we have uh, students representing all of the secondary schools attending uh, the forum. There are 10 students from each one of the secondary schools. Uh, we also have uh, 10 students from VLN, uh, Vancouver Learning Network, as well as 10 students from um, alternate education programs across the district. And um, they will be attending um, on the day of. In terms of the working group, uh, there are four different uh, secondary schools uh, that are represented along with a couple of alternate ed students uh, from alternate programs as part of that working group. Okay, uh, thank you again for your presentation. And if there's no more questions, we'll move on to receiving the committee reports. And the first on the agenda is the Facilities Planning Committee. And I'll look to uh, Trustee Wong, who is chair of that committee. Chairperson, move receipt of the report of the meeting of January 23rd of the Facilities Planning Committee. And looking for a seconder. Trustee Cho, and is there any discussion about the minutes themselves? Trustee Parrott? Um, Chairperson, I, I have noticed that um, a, different verbs are being used uh, in the report and the minutes. Um, sometimes we say that the board is proposing the move from a French version, and sometimes we say that the board is considering the move. I, I much prefer the term considering because we are having a, a significant um, 
consultation process. I think when we say proposed, it, it gives the connotation that, that we have kind of made up our minds. And so I don't, I don't exactly know how to, how to deal with that. I don't know if anybody else agrees with me, but, but I would prefer that we, when we talk about what we're doing, we're actually talking about considering the move and, and waiting for the consultation to happen. So, Trustee Parrott, I think what you're suggesting is that in uh, item three of the committee report, rather than it saying the district is proposing to relocate, you're suggesting that it should say the district is considering relocating. Yes, it's exactly what is said under the rationale on page two. It says the district is considering relocating the early French immersion program at Hudson for the following reasons. Right, so I think what we're um, what we're now considering as a board is that uh, we we uh, approve the minutes with the amendment proposed by Trustee Parrott. So if there's any any further discussion, then we'll, if there's no further discussion, I'm not seeing any trustee hands. Then we'll move to vote to approve the minutes. All those in favour? We unanimously in favour of that, and we have a number of matters arising from these reports, and I will go to Trustee Wong again. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, there are two motions, um, required motions stemming from the committee meeting, and as well, there was uh, there is one update I'd like to ask later on. But uh, the first motion is that the Board of Education authorizes the Secretary-Treasurer to sign the Fleming Elementary BC Hydro statutory right of way on their behalf. And you're moving that motion, Trustee Wong? I move. Uh, seconded by Trustee Ballantyne. Any discussion among trustees? All those in favor? A unanimous vote for the statutory right of way motion. Um, back to you, Trustee Wong. Second motion, Chairperson, um, has to do with the communication assistance for youth and adults provincial resource program, uh, a lease uh, renewal. And this one, if you'll bear with me, uh, requires six parts to it. Um, and I'll start right away. Move that the Board of Education of School District Number 39, Vancouver, Kaya lease acquisition bylaw be given first reading. And uh, looking for a seconder, Trustee Ballantyne. Okay, so we have a mover and a seconder. So unless there's any discussion, we'll move to vote on this motion. All those in favor? Unanimous in favor? Secondly, move that the Board of Education of School District Number 39, Vancouver, Kaya Leak lease acquisition bylaw be given second reading. Yeah, it's moved by Trustee Wong and seconded by Trustee Cho. All those in favor? A unanimous vote in favor? Move that the Board of Education of School District Number 39, Vancouver, approves having all three readings of the Kaya lease acquisition bylaw at tonight's meeting. Okay, and a seconder for this motion, Trustee Champ Headley. If there's no discussion, then we will vote. All those in favor? A unanimous vote in favor. Three more parts to this chairperson. Move that the Board of Education of School District Number 39, Vancouver, Kaya Lease Acquisition Bylaw be given third reading, passed and adopted this 28th day of January 2019. And a seconder, Trustee Gonzalez. And all those in favor? A unanimous vote in favor. Move that the chairperson and secretary treasurer be authorized to sign, seal, and register the Board of Education of School District Number 39, Vancouver, Kaya Lease Acquisition Bylaw 2019. Okay, and a seconder, Trustee Cho. All those in favor? A unanimous vote in favor. And finally, move that the signed and sealed. Board of Education of School District Number 39, Vancouver, Kaya Lease Acquisition Bylaw 2019 be forwarded to the Ministry of Education Funding Department for Registration and Certification. 
and a seconder. Trustee Ballantyne. And all those in favour? A unanimous vote in favour. Thank you, Trustee Wong. Thank you. And Trustee Wong, further matters arising? Chairperson, I'm not sure. Yeah, the, I guess I'll call it matters arising as opposed to new business. Um, just if staff could give us uh, the board uh, a brief update um, on the Hamber project. The Hamber project was there was a delegation presented um, at at committee, and so to put it in context. Um, uh, for this evening if we can get a brief update on the Hamber project. Thank you and Deputy Superintendent David Nelson will speak to this. Yeah, through the chair, I'm going to provide an overview of the meetings that have taken place um, with the Hamber Seismic Pro Project Consult uh, as part of the, sorry, Hamber Seismic Project Consultation Timeline. So the project, uh, as trustees know, was announced um, on June 19th of 2018. And on the 2nd of October, the uh, Eric Hamber, it's called the Seismic Project School Advisory Committee, uh, was formed. And this committee uh, has representation of uh, VBE stakeholders um, broadly, including uh, student representatives, parent representatives, representatives of school administration, and PAC representation. Um, the, there are a number of department heads um, from teaching staff uh, that are that comprise the teaching representatives, including fine arts depart, teacher librarian science, ELL, phys, uh, phy, physical education, and the athletics director. And in addition, the uh, operations staff of the school are involved on the committee. The, this committee has met um, on four occasions, October uh, 2nd, 3rd, December 3rd and January 8th. Some of those meetings included visits to um, other secondary schools, Kitsilano and U Hill Secondary. In addition, on October 4th, 5th, 15th and 16th, the project team met with and facilitated user group meetings at the school to make sure that all teaching departments, the building engineers, as well as school uh, administration had input into the design of what's called the functional program. And that's very important because it is the functional program which directs um, and provides the information for architect teams and construction teams who may uh, bid on the project. Uh, there was um, a public open house held on January 11th and consultation was open uh, for that open house through online feedback up until Friday, uh, January 25th. So it is now closed and the team is in the process of uh, collating the information that was received. On January 24th, the director of instruction for the school as well as the district principal uh, for the project also uh, met with the Hamber staff to receive additional feedback and provide information on the project. Upcoming meetings for the Seismic Advisory Committee at Hamber are January, or sorry, February 4th. At that point, a high level uh, debrief of information received through the open house will be provided, as well as an overview of uh, some of the work that's been underway to look at options for space allocations within the school. Um, an additional meeting to gather feedback on that specific topic is scheduled for February 18th. So there have been a number of and will continue to be a number of uh, consultations with stakeholders as the design of the project moves forward. I believe that um, I just also wanted to say that we've continued to have ongoing conversations uh, with the ministry through the VPO around the concerns that have been raised regarding uh, gym, specifically fine arts and gym space and continue to work with them around options um, that may be available to address those concerns within the project budget. And we're hoping to have more information in the future in that regard. I hope that's um, helpful, Trustee Wong. Thank, thank you, Associate Superintendent David Nelson. Deputy Superintendent, <laughs> time has moved on. 
<laughs> so, and, and I can add uh, a couple of updates from my perspective as the chair. I did ask that um, trustees, that the feedback information that was gathered through the survey would be made available to trustees so they could see the um, the actual feedback submitted as well as the summary information. So that will be made available to trustees. I can also say that um, uh, the superintendent and I had a meeting with the mayor invite, has been inviting a number of um, key partners across the city to meet with him for short um, opportunities to get to know each other. And uh, the superintendent and I had that meeting um, last week. And I apologize to trustees, I meant to get an update to you ahead of this meeting, but I um, haven't done that yet, but we will do so. So uh, the, the, and the Hamber project was raised with the mayor and the discussion around would the city be able to put any uh, funding into the project, particularly around the um, uh, Canby corridor. And uh, the we uh, trustees were also invited to a childcare roundtable at City Hall. Um, hosted by the Mayor of Vancouver and Minister of State for Child Care, Katrina Chen, and the option of having child care at Hamber and the use of the NLC space and different uh, funding pots was also raised at that meeting at which um, there are a number of uh, many elected officials and a number of uh, staff from different uh, levels of government. And um, finally, uh, Trustee Wong and myself uh, as the Trustee Liaison to Hamber and Trustee Wong as the Chair of the Facilities Planning Committee are doing a follow-up meeting with the delegation who came to the Facilities Planning Committee. Okay, so thank you Trustee Wong and we can move on to the next um, Standing Committee report which is a student well-being and student learning and well-being committee and I look to the chair of that committee trustee ready Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, so we held an additional meeting, um, noting that there are delegations wanting to present to the Student Learning and Wellbeing Committee. That was on January 23rd. Um, we heard from Band and Strings Program, BC Ed Access Interim Report, and All On Board, where a motion was proposed, but um, postponed until we hear more about the All On Board um, updates coming from the City of Vancouver, in particular that um, they're asking for Fair ev elimination of fair evasion tickets, um, elimination of fares for uh, children ages 0 to 18, um, and other items that we'll discuss at the next committee meeting. So you're moving receipt of the report? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and looking for a seconder? Trustee Parrott with enthusiasm. And any discussion of the uh, minutes themselves? Uh, so, trustees, is there any discussion of the, I'm looking at trustee ready, is there any discussion of the minutes themselves or any amendments you wish to make to the minutes? Uh, yes, thank you, through the chair. So just with um, the item 1.3 all on board, just to note that the motion was brought forward and that it's being brought back to the committee meeting on February 6th. So uh, we can make that change to the minutes um, and with that change in mind uh, then the board is voting to approve these minutes. So all those in favour? Unanimous approval. And we don't have any matters arising in the agenda and I'm looking around the board table and I don't see any matters arising. So we can move on to the Personnel Committee report and um, Chairperson Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. I move receipt of the report for the Personnel Committee, which was held on January 16th, 2019. Thank you. I'm looking for a seconder, Trustee Parrott. <clears throat> Any discussion of these minutes? All those in favor of receiving the report? Unanimously approved. And any matters arising from this report? None. Okay, and then from other trustees. So uh, next we have the Finance Committee report and um, Chairperson Hansen. Thank you, Chairperson. 
Uh, I move receipt of the report of the meeting of the Finance Committee held on January 16th, 2019. Thank you. And a seconder, Trustee Gonzalez. And any discussion of the minutes? So I would like to add that I have not been recorded as one of the trustees present at the meeting when I was. So with that change in mind, um, we're voting to receive the report. All those in favor? Okay, unanimous uh, support. And, oh, matters arising? Yes, thank you, Jared. There is one uh, motion coming forward uh, from our finance committee, and uh, that is that the draft budget process and summary timeline for the development of the 2019-2020 budget be approved by the Board of Education. Thank you, and a seconder, Trustee Gonzalez. And any discussion of this motion? Trustee Parrott? Thank you, Chairperson. I, I'm having difficulty uh, with this motion because I don't, I don't exactly know what I'm voting in favor of or in opposition to. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have a clear idea of what, uh, how the process will begin um, I don't have a clear idea on how communities will be involved. It says that um, th there's a committee working on it. Uh, uh, senior management is working with the communications department to identify other effective means to engage the broader community in providing input to the budget process. And, and I've been assured that when that's developed, it will come to the board. Um, but again, it's, it, the, it's, I suppose if I was only voting on the timeline, I, I could do that, but I don't, for example, I, I don't, I think that the budget process should start with needs and not with a figure. And I, and I don't know how the consultation with the private, with the stakeholders, individual stakeholders, how that's going to occur, what what uh, information they're going to be provided with. Uh, anyway, so I, I'm really looking forward to the discussion to sort of help me figure this out. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Trustee Parrott. I think um, you know the timeline is being presented in Appendix D, and I think you're saying that that's quite clear. I think the questions you have are around what is the process for stakeholder consultation and um, maybe I can uh, ask our Secretary Treasurer to speak to that and maybe from what, what he says it may bring more specific questions. Yeah, through the Chair to Trustee Parrott. Um, you know, we are planning to have um, significant consultation with stakeholders. We have, you know, um, working on s establishing, you know, meetings with uh, stakeholder groups individually. Um, and we found that to be a worthwhile exercise last year when we did it. Uh, it provided opportunity for stakeholders to speak um, more freely than if they were in a you know, group with all stakeholders, perhaps. So you, you got to understand their specific concerns and issues with respect to budget budget concerns they might have. Um, we're also working on developing, there's always, every year there's a survey that we put out to our broader community, but we're also um, working to come up with other means to engage the broader community in, in a more fulsome discussion of, you know, their concerns um, or what they might see as needs that they'd like to see in the budget. Um, we're meeting on that this week. Um, we've already had one meeting about how to, how to engage the broader community um, more widely and like I said, we're meeting again this week to have a further discussion about that. So we've also developed a, um, a more detailed timeline. So those stakeholder individual, even though the board probably, we're not gonna actually see that until, um, you know, February 20th, fi finance committee meeting on February 20th. We, you know, we've, we've already established the, some of the early dates to meet with some of the stakeholder groups before that meeting. Our intention would be 
to always provide the board or the finance committee through the finance committee uh, with updates as to um, what those consultations are, what those discussions are. Um, in the process, there's also going to be um, a couple of opportunities for the board to meet in committee of the whole to hear individual, to have members of the public and stakeholder groups, but you know, particularly anybody from the public to come and make a presentation about what their needs might be in the budget, what they see they'd like to see in the budget. Um, so, you know, we, we intend to try to make it as widespread as we possibly can and to keep the board fully informed um, along the way. And I can uh, just add one comment that uh, I think you, one of the questions you had was whether we start with a number and then go to the consultation. And my understanding is that the initial consultation is around priorities. What are the priorities you're looking for in the budget and not coming out with a number? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I heard that in the report. It sounded to me like the um, conversations that you'll have are op open-ended. They're not specifically related to um, the budget number um, and how are we going? You know, what are we? How are we going to match that? But rather, our priorities and what we think that the school system, what we think needs to be in, included in the school system to make the system better for our students. Yeah, through the chair to you, Trustee Parrott, that is the intention, you know, to keep it open-ended, um, to try to focus the conversation on equity for students, and equity meaning, you know, what is it that our students need to be successful in the system? So we're having that conversation, you know, as you know, the, um, the Finance Committee has, you know, broken up into a working group to work on a needs budget. And um, that needs budget is also now, you know, working, has developed into a smaller working group to come up with some specific terms of reference for how to go about developing that needs budget. And it will be focused on equity for students. Trustee Parent. Thank you, Chair. And, and um, I know you said that information will be provided to the trustees, but are we, I'm assuming that we're permitted to go to any of the stakeholder meetings or is it us that made people uncomfortable, do you think? To the chair, to Trustee Parrott, the stakeholder meetings are meant to be finance staff meeting with stakeholder meetings, stakeholder groups, not with trustees. Um, so we don't, we can't go to hear what they have to say. I, I think the, um, you know, the structure is so that the finance team can meet directly with the stakeholder groups, but also at the committee, at the finance committee and at the committee of the whole, trustees do have the opportunity to hear directly from the stakeholders. So there are two, two ways to get the information into the district. Okay. And, and yes, it might be us as trustees. Okay, if there's no more questions on this motion, uh, then as it has been moved and seconded, we'll take the vote. All those in favor? All those against? All those abstaining? Trustee Parrott is abstaining and the other trustees are in favor. Um, there is no other matters arising from this report on the agenda. And if there's no other matters arising from trustees, I will ask the audience to make sure that you, if you have a question for the question period, to submit it through our staff uh, so that we can address it as we get to item 11 on our long agenda. And um, to the chair, just wondering, are there matters arising from the Finance Committee as well? Or an opportunity? I didn't I think I had the opportunity. Are you, do you have a matter arising? So, okay, we can, we can continue on that. Thank you. Yeah, um, so uh, through the chair, just around the um, items covered in the Finance Committee, I was wondering more about the City of Vancouver Food Program Grant um, and if there wasn't yet a formal decision by the City of Vancouver to confirm their funding decision. Um, I think that's a question for one of our staff. Yeah, I don't know the answer, 
uh, David um, Green. To the chair, to Trustee Reddy, the, um, th for this current year, the city has made that decision. And, you know, we have signed an agreement with the city uh, to that extent. And I, I can add to that. We, you know, when uh, the superintendent and I were meeting with the mayor, there was discussion around the food grant. So an acknowledgement that it had been cut in half and that uh, the mayor was going to go back to city staff and discuss whether there was an option to restore the funding. And then that would have to be a discussion at council. Or I, I, maybe I'll, maybe that's a bit there would be a discussion within the city about whether that would be possible. And we haven't had a definitive answer from the mayor, but the discussion is ongoing. Uh, through the chair, thank you for the update. Is there a way to get that um, sort of outcome or what the follow-up process is in writing or some kind of report back to the others, um, other trustees? Um, as I said, I apologize for not getting the report from the mayor's meeting to trustees, but um, the conversation is ongoing and I, I, as soon as we get information, then we could share that. So next on our uh, agenda is uh, the reports from private session. And I can say that our private meeting of January 28th today, we did not conclude before the start of the um, public session. So um, there is no report from that meeting. Um, for the meeting of January 21st, 2019, I don't have that report with me, but I can uh, ask our staff to look for it by the end of the meeting. And if we can jump to the reports from, oh, I do have, yeah. Okay, we can jump to reports from trustee representatives. The first report is from trustee Cho on the Britannia Community Services. And are there any questions? The, the written report is in the package. I won't ask uh, Trustee Cho to read her written report, but if there's any questions from trustees. No, then we can move on to the report from Trustee Cho on the District Parent Advisory Council meeting. And are there any questions from trustees about that report? Trustee Reddy? Um, I'm just curious with the two reports presented by Trustee Cho, are there upper, is there an action item to be followed up on where folks from those groups would come to a committee or it's just a report out? Uh, the trustee reports are just the report from the liaison trustee to inform the board of the activities they, that are undergoing at their liaison organizations. Um, you know, we as the board can take any action we wish. But I don't, I don't think there's any, in neither in this follow-up. Okay. So the next report is from myself uh, to the Van City, Vancouver City Planning Commission. And I'm not seeing, are there any follow up? Uh, Trustee Gonzalez has a question. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just uh, as a follow up to that meeting, I'm just wondering if, uh, if senior management has or is in the process of putting together a team who would be involved um, as part of that process with the city plan. Because obviously, I think VSB you know, would play a very important role. So I'm just wondering if anything formal has started on our end to be part of that process. Our secretary treasurer would have a definitive answer on that particular question. But what I can say is that he and I did have a conversation about that today. And in following up from the city, we did acknowledge that we hadn't yet heard anything formal and that we would plan to have that um, answer for trustees as soon as we see, um, or as soon as we know it. But we do know that that's a priority and we want the district to be a part of the Vancouver City Planning Commission. Okay, thank you, Trustee Gonzalez. And um, the final report is from Trustee Reddy on the English Language Learner Consortium meeting. And Trustee Reddy, I understand you have some additional information to add to the report. 
Thank you, through the chair. Um, so this is um, an update from the ELL Consortium, which is an ad hoc committee of the BC School Trustees Association. So I am the trustee liaison. And uh, further to my meeting in December, um, we followed up with MPs and MLAs um, listed in the report and apologies for the late submission. Um, this is a consortium of ELL um, trustee ELL um, educators as well as trustees throughout the Lower Mainland. Um, so it was a compilation of data on newcomers that are being received by school districts which fall into two categories broadly eligible and ineligible students uh, for services. And the language comes from the federal government who provides funding to districts through the Settlement Workers and Schools Program for English Language Learning um, Settlement and Integration Services. Um, in 2014, it was noted that um, the funding body moved from the provincial government to the federal government, Immigration Refugees Citizenship Canada. And in that move, students became ineligible for services based on the federal government's criteria for settlement services. So it was discussed at that meeting with MPs uh, present and MLAs, as well as trustees from six districts that uh, many districts in BC are facing this similar pressure from ineligible students, so to speak. Um, I've uh, provided a list of ineligible students. Would it be helpful to explain who they are? Yeah. Um, briefly. Sure. Um, yeah, so ineligible students refer to work permit and post-secondary student visa holders, provincial nominees awaiting their permanent residency, refugee claimants, and returning citizens who have settlement needs. So it is a very pressing issue that's been brought forth, especially as students are directly affected. So I do think it deserves time and attention at this meeting, given that there are federal implications, that there's an immigration funding review. Um, uh, coming forward and that Manitoba, Ontario and Quebec have received funding already from the federal government for ineligible students that Manitoba has fewer numbers than British Columbia. Um, we've also been invited to engage in a witnessing activity um, in front of the standing committee with the federal government to explain the situation in, in British Columbia through these six districts in particular. Um, so. There is a, a matter arising as an urgent motion, which I would like to share. So this motion was crafted um, by the consortium and is being considered by the six districts. Um, I'll read it out that the Vancouver School Board sends letters to Robert Oliphant, MP and Chair of the Honourable and Chair and the Honourable Ahmed D. Hussein, MP and Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada to that committee with a copy to MPs and MLAs noting the importance of making ineligible clients indicating students and their families are made eligible for settlement services and programs that are delivered from within our schools and that funds are increased accordingly. I think grammatically the are made might be redundant. Is, is that yep that's okay trust yeah ready. absolutely yeah you're, you're comfortable with that change so trustee ready you're bringing forward this as an urgent motion because uh, the ELL consortium is having a concerted campaign to write to MPs and MLAs and uh, the ELL consortium has been invited to um, present to the Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada Committee in the very near future, although we don't know the state for sure. But, but the date is like, could be before our next board meeting, which is why it's coming urgently to this board meeting. That's correct, Chair. And uh, two points that were made relevant for Vancouver's district in particular is that our percentage of ineligible students is almost half of the students as, that are arriving as newcomers. Um, and that previously the ELL consortium was successful at advocating against funding cuts and has saved over 200,000 in cuts to staffing and resources for those clients. So they wanted that to be noted. 
I think I maybe I've I've gone ahead a little bit. Um, you're moving the motion, and we need a seconder for the motion. So, Trustee Cho, and I think we've you've already been speaking to the motion. Um, Trustee Parrot. So through you to the mover. Um, are these children in schools? Through the chair, it is my knowledge that they are in schools and not accessing fulsome settlement services. So I would like to suggest an amendment that we uh, write to Vancouver MPs and MLAs. Um, do we do we need to motion that, or Jennifer, do these work? If that's a friendly amendment, Jennifer, uh, Trustee Reddy, then um, we can be less formal. Okay, so that's, that's agreed around, around the table. So any further discussion on the motion? Trustee Wong? Chairperson, I'd be um, very supportive of this motion. Just recently I had a meeting with um, uh, staff at Collingwood Neighborhood House, and there were a number of instances uh, that um, this particular issue affected um, many of the citizens in or around that area. So this is a timely motion that actually fits it quite well. Thank you. Yes, uh, Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. I just have a question, uh, Trustee Reddy. Do we have any sense of numbers, how many potential kids could actually be affected by this? Trustee Reddy. The Chair, um, thank you, Trustee Gonzalez. Yes, there are um, specific figures um, by year. Would you like me to give you the last year in particular? Because there's five years of figures. Um, so IRCC eligible clients accounted last year from April 1st, 2018 to January 9th, 2019. Um, eligible clients equal 3,554 um, individuals and IRCC ineligible clients equaled 5,437 for a total of 8,991, so 60%. So thank you, Trustee Reddy. Um, I, I should explain to um, trustees and our audience that normally we do get the full, we try and very hard to get the full trustee re reports into the board agenda, but unfortunately this time the materials was not available until today. So that's why it's, it's coming late to trustees and uh, into the board package. Um, so yes, if there's no other trustees speaking, I think you know the challenge is that we as a school district have to serve every student who comes into our district, and we are we are expected to carry out certain services, but services by the federal government, and but they only fund a small a, a portion of the students who need those services. Yet we have to offer the services to all. So obviously we're being stretched in ways that we wouldn't like to be. So I'm in support of the motion. So voting on the motion as uh, presented on the screen, all those in favor? So we have unanimous support. Thank you, Trustee Reddy. And uh, coming back to the report on private session from January 21st, uh, the board met and discussed, item, and discussed items related to bargaining, property, and facilities. Um, I looking next item is new business. And if there's no new business, uh, Trustee Gonzales, you have a sorry, question? Sorry, you moved on ahead. I just wanted to do a quick update for um, reports from trustee reps just because of the BCPC. I wasn't able to do that because we were in attendance there. So I could just give a quick verbal uh, update on that. would be great. Thank you. So as the trustee liaison for the BC uh, Public School Employers Association, uh, which held its AGM last week. And um, obviously this is the framework uh, for bargaining. And as we're heading into bargaining, actually starting even today, I uh, just felt it was important to just report out that um, that is in motion and there is uh, a plan in place and uh, you know they will be representing the interests of the, of the district. So thank you. Okay, thank you Trustee Gonzalez for a concise report. Um, so no new business, no notices of motion. I'm looking at trustees. And then we have the public question period. We have a large number of questions submitted, so we will take a short recess as we organize um, uh, reading and uh, getting answers to the questions.
Okay, so we're going to call the meeting to order again and return from the recess. Uh, I apologize for the delay. We're, we're, you know, we want to be able to provide um, in-depth answers to the questions, but that can be challenging to do at very short notice. So the first question we're addressing is, what is the VSB doing for Black History Month? So staff and our students, as reported out by our student trustee Pangalian, have had preliminary discussions with respect to supporting planning events for the Black History Month. There are also meetings scheduled this week and next week, including the upcoming Student Wellbeing Committee and the Diversity Committee, um, where, we, where the district will look to hear additional information and ideas for Black History Month. Okay, and then to repeat that there is a diversity committee meeting and addressing racism and other activities and events will be discussed. Um, in addition, trustees have been invited to the city's Black History Month um, celebration and we will be represented at that event. Associate student, Superintendent Jody Langwa has additional information to provide. Thank you, through the chair. Um, there are also a number of curriculum resources that have been developed to support teachers as they honor the legacy of black Canadians, past and present. There's a secondary resource guide created by um, our VSTA, so Vancouver Secondary Teachers Association, and our district um, diversity resource teacher. Uh, in addition, there is a curriculum resource created for our primary students as well. And there is also a diversity toolkit that um, has tools for teachers to use in their classrooms to create lessons for Black History Month. In addition to that, our communications department will be profiling school activities commemorating Black History Month with features on, dis on the district website and via social media and a particular focus on student learning outcomes. And as was mentioned by Trustee Fraser, uh, there's going to be more information available after our diversity meeting tomorrow. Okay, and then the second question is, some schools in Vancouver hold slave days. Will the board make it clear to schools that it is not a reasonable undertaking to hold and why it is not? Yes, um, the, the board agrees with that and we'll ask staff to follow up with the schools. So uh, the question here is, will the summary to the board on feedback received from the Hamber Seismic Public Consultation include analysis of the, ha of the handwritten slash longhand comments? Yes, the summary will include that. How are the handwritten comments handled? Do trustees intend to read the actual comments in addition to the summary? So all the material provided in feedback will be made available to trustees in a binder. And um, it is up to you know, the individual trustees to make sure they're well informed for any decision making. When will the trustees be making a motion as requested by the delegation at the January 23rd facilities planning committee meeting to pause for collaborative consultation with all stakeholders and for the trustees to advocate on our behalf to the MOU to get Hamber built right by expanding the footprint and budget to build Hamber right. Uh, so um, trustees did not make a motion at this meeting. I don't want to speak for all trustees on that, but um, my feeling is that we are in conversation with the city. We are in conversation with the Ministry of Education. Uh, the question has been raised whether we should uh, be in conversation with the Park Board. And we as trustees are waiting to um, get the full feedback from the consultation. So my, my feeling is it, is it would be premature to um, take action now when we still have a lot of open conversations happening that we don't know the outcome to. So the question is, will you pause the seismic project at Hamber? And I think that is the same um, answer as previously. And the question is, will the board pause the seismic update process of Eric Hamber to allow for more input from the school and greater community at large? So again, we're waiting to get the feedback. I, I feel I'm waiting to get that feedback. And again, this is a, another question about pausing the update. Is 
is the process for community feedback and procurement process currently running simultaneously when it comes to the new Eric Hamber? So the community feedback process is happening at the moment and the procurement process has started, but the part of the process that has started is, and I will ask the Secretary Treasurer David Green to provide a little bit more on the, uh, I think it's the qualification. Uh, through the chair, we have um, <clears throat> the district has issued an RFQ to um, to proponents who might be interested in um, coming to the table and bidding on this project, and that's going to that went out this past week, and it's going to close in March, early March, and then from that point in time, um, a up to three candidates or three proponents will be selected to um, be provided with an RFP at the time, which would have the um, project definition or, you know, would have the um, requirements for the project to go ahead as a design build project. So that would go out then in April. Uh, if you could, no, I'm sorry, we cannot have questions from the four. We have to, we have to maintain a respectful environment in the board meeting. You are very welcome to email myself, or the secretary treasurer, for follow up. But we we need to stay with the the format that is. We need to stay with the format that we have established for the board meeting. Do you agree with the funding allocation? based on the area standards for Eric Hamber as having the best interests of our students. Is the funding on par with other provinces? So our board has already written to the Ministry of Education expressing our concerns about the ministry area standards and we have had a response from the ministry and both letters are posted on the advocacy page, advocacy correspondence page of our website. So the answer is no, the board does not agree that the area standards are appropriate for our students' learning. Given that the Eric Hamber Old School will be a swing site and could potentially have two elementary schools at the same time, what traffic measures have been put in place? So uh, this is very early in the um, discussion around potential use of the site as a swing space, so there is no definitive measures in place, but of course, as we move through the process, that will be addressed. Why is the proposed parking lot at the new Eric Hamber so large? Can it be reduced for a building footprint? Uh, I don't know the answer to the size of the parking lot, but um, we have an email address and we can respond to that question by email. What discussions have taken place with the park board considering the Oak Meadows Park as the build site? So there have been no discussions today, but that is a possibility. Uh, there is a specific question for a trustee, but uh, this is a question period for the board. So if you do want to ask a question of a uh, trustee, I encourage you to e email that trustee directly. Would the trustees advocate for CACs to be used to provide a larger school that is in line with Kitsilano and New West? Um, you know, certainly that's part of the discussions we are having with the uh, city. And I, I think you know, it would be courteous to allow those discussions to take place before we take an advocacy position. It's certainly my hope that the um, city would look favorably on, on that if we were to need, as we need additional funds. And why are future demographics not allowed? So there will be a report on the Heis uh, Hamber Seismic Project coming to a facilities planning committee. And I anticipate that um, that will include the, uh, some demographics around student enrollment. So this question is, will there be an open meeting of all stakeholders re Hamber Seismic Project before the end of February to discuss the feedback collected on the project? And my understanding is that will come at the Facilities Planning Committee. Will the board write a letter to the Minister of Education to review the rebuild formula for seismic upgrades of all schools in the province? And again, the board has already written to the Minister of Education about our concerns with the ministry area standards. Um, 
The public consultation for the Hamber seismic upgrade did not provide the functional program and stated that the budget had already been set. How could adequate consultation be achieved without sharing with a fundamental program and with a fixed budget prior to public consultation? Um, well, the province sets the budget for a project uh, as they move it forward and the consultation underway now is around what programming could be offered at the school. Can the school board assure me that there will be an opportunity for my daughter now in grade eight to complete the fashion design and technology program at Hamburg? She would graduate in June 2023. Um, you know, I, there are many factors that go into which, which uh, courses are offered at a school. I think it's difficult to make that assurance. Um, you know, it might be based on staffing, but I think the intent of the board is to make sure that that space is available within the uh, design program so that the space issue would not be, uh, the space allocated would not preclude offering that program. And for the 2019-2020 school calendar, what is the last day of instruction in June? And the school calendar for 2019-2020 has not yet been approved at that point, but it will be during the spring. Yeah. And that is all the questions that we have this evening. So that we're able to answer. Yes, we do have, uh, if questions are not submitted with uh, a name or contact information, then um, it is practice not to answer the questions. Okay, thank you everyone for coming up tonight. I look for a motion to adjourn from trustees. Um, moved by Trustee Champ Headley, seconded by Trustee Cho. And all those in favour, a unanimous approval. And I, may I remind trustees that we have to reconvene our private meeting. So if we could do that uh, fairly promptly, that would be much appreciated. Thank you.